Welcome to section 2.2 guys where we're going to discuss the differences between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So when we first look at cells there's really two big categories and I know a lot of times people like to think that they're plant and animal cells. Uh, but ultimately plant and animal cells are both eukaryotic cells. You know they're both one type of cell, one big broad group of cells. They just happen to be two common types that we deal with oftentimes. So a lot of people think oh yeah those must be the major guys but they're not. You're wrong, all right? So the two ultimate guys that we're gonna discuss are prokaryotic cells, uh, commonly called bacteria. These are gonna be the simpler cells you guys might have learned. And eukaryotic cells, which will typically be more complex. They'll be bigger. And so in the picture here, you've got these bacterial cells. And this is not to scale. Uh, bacterial cells are typically gonna be about one-tenth or less the size of a eukaryote. But we do have these eukaryotic cells here. These are skin cells, I believe, from humans. And you can see the nucleus, that's the telltale sign that this is going to be a eukaryotic cell. Eukaryotic means true nucleus, whereas prokaryotic means before a nucleus. So it doesn't have a nucleus, it's older than that. And you can see several of the different shapes of bacteria here. They don't all look identical, uh, but these bacteria, these prokaryotes, will be smaller, they'll be simpler. You'll notice that you might see stuff on them, which is cool. Uh, but you're not normally going to see much stuff inside of them. There is some stuff there, but it tends to be relatively small. They don't have these elaborate structures that we tend to find in eukaryotic cells. So with a good microscope in a eukaryotic cell, you might be able to see a lot of different organelles, like little pieces. Uh, so in some cases, you can see like these fibers that are in them, mitochondria, chloroplast, the nucleus. Uh, you tend not to see much with prokaryotes. They're pretty simple when it comes down to things. So starting off, the major difference between these two is just where they put their DNA. Uh, so if you are a eukaryotic cell, so this is going to be the eukaryotic way, uh, eukaryotic cells are going to go ahead and put their DNA inside this membrane-bound structure called the nucleus. Ignore that little dot here, it's called the nucleolus, it's a separate structure that makes ribosomes, uh, but it is inside the nucleus. And so this nucleus is going to be one of the dead giveaways. And this is one of the first things that they discovered when they looked at cells with microscopes because the nucleus is also one of, if not the largest, organelle that the cell possesses. So when you're looking at something with a microscope, it's one of the easiest things to detect as far as organelles go. There are other organelles you can see here that are involved uh, that eukaryotes tend to have that prokaryotes don't, but they're smaller so we don't normally see them as much. They're harder to detect. Whereas if you're a prokaryote, you're just going to go ahead and put your DNA in the cytoplasm. It's going to just kind of be in the inside of the cell. There will typically be a region, it's called the nucleoid, not the nucleus, but there will be kind of a region that's in there where you put it. But I like to think of this where if you have a one-room studio, you might have like kitchen stuff, but that kitchen stuff doesn't have a wall to separate it. It's just going to be one side of your room will happen to have a stove and countertop, etc. Whereas with the eukaryote, the eukaryotic way or the, with eukaryotes, they're going to go ahead and have like an actual room that's a kitchen that's got walls that's separated. So whenever you talk about eukaryotes, they're much more compartmentalized than a prokaryote. A prokaryote will always be like that one room schoolhouse or that one room apartment where everything is still there. You still have a couch and a TV and a bed and a kitchen uh, and a table and all that stuff, but they're all kind of organized in one big space without dividers. Whereas with eukaryotes, this is where we like to make lots of separate dividers so each thing that's going on gets its own space and it's kind of cut off from the rest of things so it can focus on that one task. Both of them are able to survive just fine, so don't assume that one of these guys is better than the other guy. Uh, eukaryotes will be more complex than prokaryotes, but complexity does not necessarily mean better. Prokaryotes are still doing very well, so try not to think whenever we talk about anything biologically, try not to equate something that's more complex with being better. You know, I know it's easy to say that humans are somehow better because we're more complex, but if something really bad happened, we would die long before many of these prokaryotes would. We'd die long before many simple invertebrate animals would because they need less food. You know, a lot of them can tolerate a lot wider range of conditions. And so just because we're complex doesn't mean we're invincible or somehow amazing or somehow better. We just happen to be more complex. So prokaryotes, just a little bit more detail. These guys are incredibly diverse. 
but each individual species or type of prokaryote will tend to be very limited. I like to think of this where if they go hiking, a prokaryote would be the guy that's got like a hatchet, a match, and some shoes. You know, he's not bringing a whole bunch of stuff. They're relying on the fact that they can do one thing incredibly well. And so if they're in the right conditions, they thrive. You know, they can go nuts. But if they're in bad conditions, they don't have a fallback. You know, if there's a snowstorm, they don't have a tent. They don't have uh, a whole lot of stuff as far as food that's saved up. They don't have all those other functions. They do a couple functions, but they do them extraordinarily well. Now, this is beneficial because so long as the conditions are right, they're not wasting their energy on all that other stuff. They're not trying to lug all the extra gear that they don't need. So don't, once again, assume that these guys, by saying that they're limited, don't assume that means that they're weak or they're somehow shy of things. They just tend to be very specific. You know, in the right conditions, they're the best, but in the wrong conditions, that particular prokaryote would not make it. But a different prokaryote might, once again, be perfect for those conditions, the new ones, and then that guy would thrive. These guys are the oldest cells that we have. So we have fossils that go back about 3.5 billion years of prokaryotic cells. And so we have a long history of billions and billions of years of these guys being around. And especially because they're so small, these guys are still more numerous and more common than eukaryotic cells. So when you look around and see plants and animals that are eukaryotic, it's easy to think that most cells are eukaryotic because we are and the stuff we eat generally is. But even on your own body, you're outnumbered about 10 to 1 by prokaryotic cells because they're so small, they're coating your skin, they're all through your digestive tract. So even on our own body, we're the minority. Uh, these eukaryotic cells are the, the minority because prokaryotes just thrive so easily and they're so small that they can manage to populate tremendously without taking up much space, without being very noticeable. Uh, this idea is just that we'll oftentimes refer to prokaryotes as bacteria. Uh, specifically, you might see people mention something like eubacteria. That's just one group. That's the bacteria that tend to live on us. These are the guys that tend to uh, cause us harm. And then there's also another version uh, called Archaebacteria. If I can write that here, that should be a CH there if you can't see. But Archaebacteria tend to be some bacteria that, that seem to be very archaic. That's the archae part. Uh, these guys tend to be extremophiles. They tend to like conditions that are rather acidic, rather salty, rather hot. So they like a lot of these kind of extreme, these kind of wild conditions that we would not survive. Uh, and as such, these guys typically do not cause us disease or anything else. We don't normally bump into these guys too much because they generally live in environments that we would not live in. And I've already talked about the smaller thing, but on, in general, these guys will be about one-tenth the size of a eukaryotic cell, sometimes smaller. It can be up to a hundredth the size uh, or more, but these guys are way smaller. You know, just like if you're only taking that hatchet and a match, you don't have a whole bunch of stuff with you, so you're not going to be carrying a bunch of gear. You're going to be smaller. Whereas somebody who's got a backpack with a tent strapped to it and a cooler that they're dragging behind them, they're going to take up way more space. And so in this case, eukaryotes will take up way more space than bacteria. Bacteria are very good at just kind of sneaking into whatever small place because they're tiny. And now eukaryotes, these guys will have evolved more recently. Uh, so these guys only go back about two, maybe two and a half billion years ago. So they're relative newcomers, if you will, on the, the block in, of life. These guys will be much larger, and that's partly because they're housing a nucleus as well as all these other organelles that we'll talk about later. But you can see there's lots of other stuff that's in the cell. It's not just about a nucleus. There's a bunch of other organelles, that we, as we call them, uh, that will also be doing specific jobs inside the cell. And so that makes them be a lot bigger. Uh, and they're going to have this idea of rooms or compartments. And the idea here that we might talk about is membrane-bound organelles is the fancy term. And that what that means is a lot of their organelles, a lot of the, the parts of them, they will put a membrane around it, and that isolates it from the rest of the cell, kind of like a room where you've got walls, and they can then use the inside space, what's inside of that membrane. So in other words, this kind of area that's inside here, they can use that to do a specific task. So they can have an organelle that just does cell respiration, or an organelle that just does photosynthesis, or an organelle that just breaks stuff down using enzymes. 
And so in a prokaryotic cell, that stuff normally has to be done in the cytoplasm. They don't have like a, or the cytosol, they don't really have like a special place to put it. They could have it occur kind of on one end of the cell, you know, just like you could put the table and chairs on one end of your room, even if you just have one big room, but you can't divide it off as cleanly as something like a eukaryote can, where it puts up that membrane and says, all right, we now have where this is isolated. It has a barrier between it and the rest of the cell. So this does allow us to get very efficient and it allows us to do more functions. So this is like the backpacker that has the backpack and food and a rain uh, cover, uh, like a tent, uh, a tarp. You know, they have uh, a cooker, so they've got ultimately propane. They've got a propane stove. You know, they're ready to go if the apocalypse happens. They're good. You know, the zombie apocalypse can occur and they'll be outfitted well enough that they've got a baseball bat and an ax and whatever else they need. But the consequence is, it also takes a lot more energy to support all that extra stuff, which eukaryotes need more energy. And because they're so much bigger, it tends to make them slower. And so you may not thrive as well as somebody else who has just what they need because you're trying to drag along all those extras that you're probably not going to need. Now that doesn't mean if it starts snowing or raining or you get stranded that you wouldn't wish you had that stuff if you didn't. Uh, but ultimately, most of the time, you'll see that somebody who's got just what they need will do better than somebody that has a bunch of extra stuff. And so eukaryotes are doing okay, but in general, they're certainly not just out-competing prokaryotes, and we're not seeing bacteria go extinct. That's not going to happen anytime soon. Now, the last thing I wanted to bring up is there is this idea of unicellular versus multicellular. So this idea of just one cell, and when you look at one cell, you're going to see all prokaryotes are going to be single-celled, and many eukaryotes will be single-celled. But there are some organisms that are multicellular, where they've taken this idea of specializing with organelles, this idea of specializing by having like special parts of the cell that do specific tasks. Uh, they've taken that idea and they've kind of went crazy with it, where they've said, all right, what if we instead have a whole bunch of different cells together, and some of those cells start to specialize. So we don't just have organelles that are specialized, we can say, all right, you're going to be a specialized tissue or group of cells where you're going to go through and you're going to filter out and uh, get rid of waste. And then these other guys, they're going to get food and break down the food. And then overall, we're just going to share everything so that we all can live, but everybody does stuff by doing just their piece. It's like the assembly line where you just put in that one screw or a couple screws, and then the next guy does his specific thing, and the next guy does his specific thing, and then overall, before you know it, we've built a car, or we've built a plane, or whatever it is we're making. It's that same idea that we see in organisms like us, where you have a heart that has a specific task, lungs that have a specific task, in this case, gas exchange, the heart's pumping blood. Uh, you've got things like your kidneys that filter your blood from waste and get rid of that. Your digestive tract digests, that one should be obvious. Uh, so we have all these different parts of ourselves that are groups of cells doing a specific task that allow us to live. Even though we're made of a bunch of cells, we live essentially as one organism because all of our cells depend on the other cells. You know, our heart depends upon the liver doing its job. Our liver depends upon the kidney, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas with that unicellular organism, he ultimately did everything needed to live because if he didn't do something needed to live, he dies. There's nobody else, there's no other cells that are going to do something for him or her. I suppose they don't have to be sexist towards cells, even though they're kind of not really a gender. Uh, and so there's this switch here where I want you guys to realize that only eukaryotes can be multicellular. So when we talk about plants, when we talk about animals, when we talk about fungus, uh, in some cases you might even see them mention protus, which is kind of the simplest version of eukaryotes, uh, but some of them are multicellular all of those will be eukaryotic. So if I ask you something like what types of cells will be, uh, will be multicellular, you should make sure you know that's gonna be a eukaryotic cell because all prokaryotic cells are single celled. You know, they're very, very, very set to just streamline and do the littlest amount possible to survive and to thrive. That's their method. I hope you guys have enjoyed this one. I'll see you guys tomorrow.